First, it just makes me so happy, Carlo, to have you back here. Um, I was just telling him uh, when I met him that I first heard the Lens Dream in Torino when uh, Torino was the world design capital and when you had a small working group uh, to which I came and you presented your vision about having an open copy left network for sustainability. I can't remember which year that was, but it was a very long time ago because I think there have been many world design capitals after that that ICSID has put together. Um, so, and I think I start with that before I go to my keynote because it, it takes a lot of hard work to start an idea, to float it, to get people to buy into it, to create a network with the vision and depth that you see here. And the fact that so many of you have come makes me even happier because it means that we have a regional base to do something and these open networks are very valuable. So thank you very much, Carlo, for that. And thank you too to our own Lens team, <laughs> led by Mary Jacob, uh, Deepta Satish, and many others in Shishti. They've kept this flag flying. Right, from the last conference to now, uh, we've done many uh, projects that have been part of the Lens Network, and I just look forward to where it's going to go next, and this regional cooperation now growing, because as you said, you have a large number of regional colleges just here in India. And maybe I'm going to provoke s some thought on that. So the topic that I was actually you know, that came up in discussion and which was given to me was what are the challenges of design, you know, that sustainability faces and the role of design education and what does it play? And I have three main points, you know, dangerous ideas, creative disturbances and ethical wisdom. But before I go into that, today is always that day which is very unique, which is very special. And today it's personal for me. Today is my grandson's fourth birthday. And those are my two grandchildren. And if you talk about a world of sustainability, you are talking about the world of the future. You know, it's not for me today. But it's for those two young children on that bed that we build a world of the future. And we need to remember that. And that kind of stuck in my head today. That I don't think that we can start just by talking about education, because we're also talking about futures. And we're also talking about futures for people. And nationally, we also can't forget this. And that was the Yamuna River just a few days ago. And if industry and industrial design has done anything in this country, it has helped to create that. If we're here to talk about design education without having that context, we have no context. Right? So we have today that kind of river. I didn't choose the images of people actually worshipping the Yamuna in the midst of that foam because I thought it was too problematic even for me. So let's frame this conversation on sustainability, on designing for sustainability. Is it just about products, services, and systems? Or are we looking at one, creating futures for the young people who are being born just now? Or are we cleaning up the mess of the designers and the industries that came before us? We have two jobs to do not just one. So what does sustainability mean? It is immediate, it is today, it is for the future. Having said that, I felt I had really nothing more to say. Because I went back to an NID CII conference I was speaking at in 2007, December 13th, 2007. Shishti Design Summit, provocations, and dangerous ideas. 
And somehow I thought if the world has not shifted so much from 2007 to 2016, where we're almost 10 years down the line, and I'm talking about local, regional context of India, then I needed to bring it up again. I needed to bring it up to say, talking is really not enough. And we can be educators and educators and talk behind the sanitized, clean walls of our classrooms, but I don't think, if you look, I've taken the slides, many of the slides, I've deleted very few. At that conference, where I was giving the keynote to both educators and designers, and we, I was talking about sustainability, I was saying that how we tend to have intellectual blinkers. And like that counselor who's trying to make change, there is somebody who's saying, well, I'm not going to listen because it doesn't concern me. And really, the pink waters of the foam-filled Yamuna are the intellectual blinkers of our policy-making communities and our industries who just kept saying, well, we can go clean it up as long as we do business as usual. And so the challenge in sustainability, in design, and in education is to really look very clearly and identify these intellectual blinkers that continuously stop us from hearing, thinking, or seeing the reality as we see it ahead of us. 2007 was also the time around which Al Gore had just published his Inconvenient Truth. Right? It seems history now. Right? His film, The Eleventh Hour. But you notice that everybody is going to reassuring lies. They're not going in to see or hear about inconvenient truths. They'd rather go and see the film of reassuring lies. And very often in sustainability, this is what we are told to believe. That climate change would not happen. That the data was being fixed. That this was not an intercontinental, global, galactic problem that it was small and regional, that it could be controlled, that it could be managed, that nuclear power was okay because we needed the energy. We heard all these reassuring lies. Policy makers went out and put money out behind them. And there were these small networks, like the ones that we are sitting here today, that kept standing up and presenting the inconvenient truths. Milano has been one place where we've always heard the other side, the other inconvenient truth, but everybody goes towards the reassuring lie. Of course, at that conference, and the two slides I next present, were to do with us. And the question that I posed, and this was the thing, is that could Asia afford that vision? And with the steel flyover coming up in Bangalore today, or people are still fighting it, I don't know whether we've even understood that reassuring lie. Can we actually afford a vision that's in that picture? With the number of people we have in our communities and our societies and our countries and our region, can we afford a Western, North-styled kind of growth and consumption pattern and while the rest of the world, because it's got shrinking and uh, more mature democracies and more de mature economies, can actually spend time worrying about it. And this was my question, my provocation, my d idea in 2007. And what I see is this is becoming a grim reality for me here in Bangalore. The, the vision that our politicians have is to build this 22 kilometer steel flyover at the cost of our environment and to put off the day of dealing with mass transportation, which is much more sustainable. And the second question I asked then was, if small was the new big, because by then, you know, Schumacher was not new in 2007, Fitzroff Capra was not new, there were so many people, uh, Ezio Manzini, 
Carlo, Alistair Ford Luke, so many people talking about slow cities and slow businesses and slow democracies. And here we were just building things bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the second idea that I want to, to really highlight, that we can't talk about scale only in, when we're talking about sustainability and design, only about scope or reach. Scale has to be about depth. Scale also has to be about the nature or the form in which something is scaling. Again, I'm only repeating what I said in 2007. It frightens me that it's still relevant. And again, at that same conference, I asked, what can design thinking do? Because design has become this almost universal cure, if you like, which worries me, right? Something that you give for everything. And that was a question that still worries me. And the question that I had asked that time was whether Indian education, and I wasn't talking only about design education, will get ready for today, where we know we're in a startup economy, driven, driven by ideas. But I also wanted to make and find out what it meant to work along with artists, ecologists, social scientists. And I asked what the map of the world would look 10 years, and we are there now today. So this is the past. This is what I talked about in 2007, about design, about design education, about sustainability, and I was speaking at the CII NID Design Summit. So to refresh ourselves, sustainability is about resources. There's no doubt about that. It's about using resources cautiously, frugally, carefully, sensibly, simply. And design has a lot to do with that. Design has a huge amount to do with that. But sustainability is also about maintaining life and societies. You cannot go to people who have no water and who have no electricity and who have no roads and tell them, be happy the way you are. You can't do that. So it is about life and it is about personal choices but it is about being more effective with what we have rather than to just consume it. And this, put very simply, has four points for all of you, which you're going to debate over two days, so I'm not going to take too much time. What does it mean for business? What does it mean for community? What does it mean in terms of consumption of energy? And eventually, what does it mean for well-being? Just four points. But they do cover an enormous territory. So if these are the ideas, then where are the creative disturbances happening? Where can we look to see where people are doing things differently. One of the places for creative disturbance is this new community that's growing online, which is called the Art and Earth Science Community. And they are a mixture of artists, climatologists, geologists, designers, working across the world in much the same way that Lens is doing, sharing through audio podcasts, because they can't actually do video and they don't have the net, but they are actually saying, they're asking questions. And here are artists who are using the earth as an inspiration, and it's a big collaborative project. And it is located at the home of the University of Austin at Texas, where Roger Molina, who's also on our board, sits and he calls this project the Creative Disturbance Project. Right? It is about not being satisfied with what you're doing and bringing unlikely bedfellows together to say that if you work together, you don't have to belong to the same community. You can actually be very different. I actually do have the website, and at the end, I'll show it to you. 
there is another creative disturbance project that I've been following, and that is called the Human Impact Initiative. And these people just collect stories. They collect stories, personal tales of innovation and impact, and they just put it up. And, and, and the point is, sometimes everybody just needs inspiration about that small success somewhere to be able to say, well, here's the human impact. And it is making, and they're just doing it through podcasts. So anybody can download it and listen to it without too much technology. So what is creative disturbance then? And why do I think it's important in terms of design education to provide those spaces? One is it brings together unlikely or rather unusual clusters of people and ideas. Second, it generates alternative ways of perceiving our reality. And third, it creates optimism through, through and hope. And I was telling Mary when she asked me when I would give this keynote, I said that, you know, unless I can make myself feel optimistic about the future, it's very hard to talk about a sustainable future. You have to remain determinedly and aggressively optimistic. And this group of people are trying to do that. They're collecting the stories, human impact. They've been in Africa. They have radios. They, they're working with so many different milieus across. So if I've talked about the dangerous ideas, and if I've talked about creative disturbance, which is just about getting through complacency that we, if we sit together today, have the answers and puncture that sense of self-satisfaction because we don't have the answers. Then we come to two points about education. Points that Francisco Varela calls ethical wisdom. How do we make choices and how do we make choices about what people should learn, where they should learn, how they should learn in the context of sustainability, wellness, well-being, and human good. Well, there are two aspects that Varela proposes and which I think that we see here in what we do here in Srishti. One is, he says, education and design education and arts education and cultural education must necessarily be inactive. It must create something through embodied personal experience. I mean, that's why I put up the pink waters. That's why I put up my grandchild. If I have nothing from my own experience to bring here to you today, it's meaningless. Inactive selves are embodied selves that work with phenomena and primary experience through engagement with that experience. And second, he places a very high value on introspection and contemplation, to be introspective and contemplative. And then this, he says, gives you the capability to make wise decisions. And in the end, our future is all about that. Whether we're designers or whether we're politicians, the capability to make an ethically wise decision lies on our able to get into a problem through immersive, inactive, engaging, engagement and experience with direct phenomena, not at, the, at a computer looking at a picture. And secondly, to be able to introspect, contemplate about it before we can make these wise decisions. And this goes to the core of what education should be. So you see all three aspects of this present here in Shishti today. The Shishti system, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So this catalyst that we have, which is creatively disturbing, is there in our research and collaborations. The design, earth, environment, and law laboratory. Putting them together. Shishti films, environ en environmentally engaged, art in transit, huge migrations taking place through the metro, 
What does it mean? What does it mean for technology? What does it mean for sustainability? What does it mean for people? Frugal design. How can we do things simpler? How can we do things better? How can we do things with less? Natural fibers. What is it that we have in our locality? Is it areca nut? Or is it water hyacinth? What can those fibers tell us about materiality? Can we convert that materiality into opportunities for products, services, and systems? Impact edge. Not enough to have the material. Not enough to have frugality and simplicity. But they also have to be business enterprises that make an impact on communities, on societies, on makers, and on artisans. The UNESCO chair looking at cultural landscapes which are as important as natural landscapes. We're seeing language disappear from our horizon. In this state alone, Canada is spoken less and less. It's hard to find original literature printed in it. Music is becoming homogenized through globalization. So cultural landscapes, natural landscapes, and sustainability are the core of the UNESCO chair at Shrishti. We have an art science group that is just working at looking at developing sensors so that people can find out how contaminated their water is for as little as four or five hundred rupees. And that's an artist, not a technologist, not a scientist, working with design students. So that's the creative disruptive milieu that is carefully fostered to be able to support an academic infrastructure which has courses that again allow these inactive, introspective, contemplative spaces to emerge because they're not one-dimensional and because they're transdisciplinary. Business services and systems design is the source of our Bachelor of Design. Information arts and information design practices looks at data and data visualization. In public spaces, we have public space design, knowledge systems, heritage design, and contemporary art, all to do with developing ecological consciousness and sustainability. And of course, our project-based learning system, which takes the contextual and immersive and makes it inactive and generative. So what then are the sustainability challenges for design education? You're going to be talking about distributed economies. You're going to be talking about community-based livelihoods. But these have always existed in India. They are not new to our country. And they were foregrounded by Gandhi many, many years ago. So let's not come to this saying we didn't have a history of it. We had a history of distributed economies. And we had a history of designing for sustainability at the level of the village economy. But today, more than ever, we've lost faith in that. And so building on local territorial capital and enhancing economies not of scale but of impact that is simultaneously local and immediate. We can't keep waiting. We can't keep waiting. People who are needed need a solution now. There is no air to breathe in Delhi anymore. So it, the time has gone for us to sit around and say, it, we're, we're working on it. We need to redefine design as inclusive of culture. You know, I find sometimes the meetings that I come to here are keep cultural knowledge outside. And specialist Western educated design learning inside. Gandhi was about the village economy. We need to bring local knowledge systems and traditions and we need to bring them in here. I know we have an MA that's trying to do that. But I do think that it's important to bring it into the discourse. And one of the things Shishti has done is it's trying to build a whole school of new humanities and design. 
what can the humanity is, how can it be redefined because not just come and have a sociologist take a few humanities classes for design students, just like sometimes we have people now who have gone off to a technical college to say, well, can you teach design fundamentals to uh, engineering students? I don't mean that. What does that creative disturbance actually cause? And that, I think, is critical to how we will reshape design education because it will change not only its practice, but it will change it through pedagogy. But the main thing is, for whom are we doing it? Right? Because there is a power shift. So before I go to the last point, I have one that I would like Lens India to include arbitrators, people who are talking about water disputes, people who are talking about groundwater, whose water belong, whose, whose water is it underneath the ground? Is it a free and open resource? We need lawyers for that. We need to understand that we can't design product services and systems which eliminate toxic dumping if we don't deal with toxic dumping. I would like Lens India to bring artists into the fold who will creatively disrupt and disturb the calmness and the complacency with which we work so that if we get more distraught and we get more angry, maybe we will get something new coming out of it. And it comes from poetry and it comes from writing as well. In my 2007 presentation, I had some slides I'm going back to now. India is in all those ages simultaneously. The West can say we have moved into the information and the conceptual age. But India has agriculture, mainstream hardcore industry, information, and idea-based economy running parallel at the same time. So sustainability and design education looks very different. Because you can't omit agriculture. And agriculture is where traditional knowledge and wisdom is. So you need symphonies and synthesis. We also have a new class of people of which all our students are part of. They are a new creative class. They're the new middle class. They want a new India. And you're there in very, very large numbers. Your consumption patterns are going to determine what the future of sustainability is. So how do we change those values? And where are the people? You've already said it, but here is where the people are. So I close with a rephrased question from the two, 2007, saying that are we in India ready for this, where the economy will be driven by ideas, where survival be small, not big, and where designers working along with artists, ecologists, and social scientists will try and make it happen. How can we create and locate the power shift? And I don't know what the map of the world will look like 10 years from now, because the last 10 years we've looked pretty much the same. But then, like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, I would like to believe in impossible things. And that's the mandate, I think, that you have. You have to believe in the future. You have to believe in galactic change. You have to believe that if you believe six impossible things before breakfast, you can make it happen. Thank you. <laughs>